All right, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, sorry. I will start with some travel at the invitation of the Kingdom of Morocco. Our Deputy Secretary General, Mina Mohamed, will travel to Rabat uh, over the weekend on Sunday. Uh, once in Morocco, she will take place in the high-level ministerial conference on middle-income countries. This conference brings together middle-income countries, the UN system, international and regional financial institutions, and key development partners uh, to identify new and innovative uh, approaches to require to support the development needs of these countries and meet the sustainable development goals. The Deputy Secretary General will also have bilateral meetings with senior government officials, UN colleagues on the ground, and other stakeholders. And she'll be back uh, in New York. She'll be returning to New York on the 6th of February. Um, Turning to Gaza, in a statement issued today, Philippe Lazzarini, the head of the um, of UNRWA, said the colossal humanitarian needs of over two million people in Gaza now face the risk of deepening following the decision by 16 donor countries to stop financial contributions to the organization. He reiterated the Secretary General's call to resume funding to UNRWA, warning that if the funding remains suspended, the agency will most likely be forced to shut down operation by the end of February, not only in Gaza, but in across the region. Uh, in Gaza itself, our colleagues at the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs report that thousands of Palestinians continue fleeing the southern town of Rafa, which is already hosting half of Gaza's population of 2.3 million people. Most are living in makeshift structures, tent or out in the open according to UNRWA. Uh, meanwhile, UNICEF estimates that at least 17,000 children in the Gaza Strip are unaccompanied or separated from their families. This corresponds to 1% of the overall displaced population of 1.7 million people. The conflict has had a severe impact on children's mental health. UNICEF now estimates that almost all children in the Gaza Strip need some sort of mental health or psychosocial support. That's more than one million children. Since the start of the conflict, UNICEF and its partners have provided this kind of support to more than 40,000 children and 10,000 caregivers. Given the scale of needs, this is far from sufficient, and the only way to deliver these services at scale is with a humanitarian ceasefire. Uh, turning to uh, Ukraine, uh, the humanitarian coordinator for the United Nations in Ukraine, Denise Brown, has condemned a deadly attack on aid workers that took place in the south of the country. Two aid workers from an NGO were killed yesterday, several others injured when their vehicles were attacked. Just a week ago, a similar attack on humanitarian vehicles took place in the town of Chasiv Yar in the east. Last year, 58 workers were killed or injured in Ukraine, including 11 who were killed in the line of duty. Despite the challenges and insecurity, humanitarian workers continue uh, to deliver aid. Today, an interagency humanitarian convoy delivered three trucks of humanitarian uh, supplies to the residents of frontline communities in Kharkiv area. The supplies included hygiene kits, uh, thermal blankets, sleeping bags, kitchen sets, evacuation kits, and construction material to repair damaged homes. A quick update from our peacekeeping colleagues in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. They're reporting that earlier today, uh, presumed members of the M23 armed group fired upon one of our UN helicopters, and that took place in the Karuba region. Um, in North, Kivu's, uh, in North Kivu province, near Maisisi territory. The incident resulted in the injuries of two South African uh, peacekeepers, including one who was seriously membered, uh, wounded. The helicopter was able to land safely in Goma, and the peacekeepers are currently receiving medical attention. In a press statement today, the head of our peacekeeping mission there, Bintu Keita, strongly condemned the attack against a, an aircraft bearing the UN emblem, which comes almost a year after similar attack caused the death of a South African peacekeeper. She recalled that attacks against peacekeepers may constitute war crimes. The mission will spare no effort in cooperation with the Congolese authorities to bring the perpetrators to justice. Meanwhile, the head of our peacekeeping department, Jean-Pierre Lacroix, uh, joined by Catherine Pollard, the Undersecretary General for Management, Strategy, Policy, and Compliance, along with Christian Saunders, the Special Coordinator on Improving 
UN response to sexual exploitation and abuse are all in the DRC. They arrived in Beni in North Kivu today, where they will continue their visit to the eastern part of that country. And a humanitarian update from Ethiopia, where we are told that the impact of an El Nino-driven um, drought is ravaging communities in Afar, in Amhara, in Tigray, and Oromia, as well as southern and southwest Ethiopia's people's region. Severe water shortages, dried pastures, and reduced harvest are impacting millions of lives of human beings, as well as the livestock, with reports uh, of food insecurity and rising malnutrition. In a joint statement, uh, the UN and the government of Ethiopia called for urgent funding to respond to food insecurity across the Northern Highlands. A recent joint assessment by our humanitarian partners and the government concluded that the number of critically food insecure people will continue to grow over the next few months, reaching a peak of 10.8 million people during the lean season, which is from July and to September. Malnutrition rates in parts of Afar, Amhara, and Tigray and other regions have already surpassed globally recognized crisis threshold, although the situation is currently not reflective of famine-like conditions. Meanwhile, the situation in many of these areas is already alarming. Our humanitarian colleagues note that there is an opportunity to avert serious humanitarian catastrophe through additional funding to urgently scale up and sustain response efforts. More than six million people are already being assisted with food and cash across affected areas, but much more needs to be done. And um, in the Central African Republic, we and our partners today launched the 2024 Humanitarian Appeal for that country, which plan calls for $370 million to support 1.9 million people next year, this year rather, excuse me. While the situation has improved in some areas, humanitarian needs will remain high this year. This is mainly due to the consequences of conflict as well as the impact of the war in Sudan and insecurity in the border region with Chad. In some relatively stable areas across the country's in interior, and after consultations with authorities and communities, humanitarian organizations will work with development partners to provide support and uh, protection as well as resilience. And in Sudan, uh, our World Food Program colleagues are ringing the alarm and warning that almost 18 million men, women, and children across Sudan are currently facing acute hunger, which uh, translate to phase three on the integrated food security phase classification system. WFP is also um, raising the alarm about the number of hungry people that has more than doubled from a year ago. Despite the efforts by WFP to reach as many people in need as possible, uh, the food agency is currently only able to regularly deliver food assistance to one in 10 people facing emergency levels of hunger. that are trapped in conflict hotspots, including Khartoum, Darfur, Kordofan, and now Al Jazeera State, which we've been talking about. It's becoming nearly impossible for aid agencies to get to these hotspots due to continued insecurity, uh, enforced roadblocks, and demands for fees and taxation. Um, and that's a diplomatic way of talking about other things. Uh, the situation will get worse if immediate guarantees for the safe and unimpeded delivery of humanitarian food assistance to conflict-hit parts of Sudan are not provided. To prevent a crisis from becoming a catastrophe, WFP continues to underscore that people in Sudan must be able to access aid and food immediately. Uh, speaking of food, um, WFP's partner agency, the Food and Agricultural Organization, reported today on the food price index that the benchmark for world food commodity prices fell further in January. This was highlighted by decreases in the price of cereals and meat. The FAO food price index, which tracks monthly changes in the international prices of a set of globally traded food commodities, averaged 118 points in January, down 1% from December, and 10.4% from its corresponding value one year ago. Um, two international days. Int James, you're fascinated. This is World Wetlands Day. A uh, broad definition of wetlands includes freshwater, marine, coastal ecosystems, lakes, and rivers. As you know, these are critical to people and nature. And on Sunday, we mark the International Day of Human Fraternity. In his message for the day, the Secretary General calls to reaffirm our commitment to bridging decades uh, divides, fostering religious understanding and cooperation among all people of cultures and beliefs. 
Monday we will have a guest, and that is uh, Rabab Fatima, the Under Secretary General and High Representative for Least Developed Landlocked uh, Developing Countries and Small Island Developing States. She will here to brief you on the fourth international conference on small island developing states called SIDS 4, which will be held from the 27th to the 30th of May in St. John's in Antigua and Barbuda. Lastly, a quiz. Jane is back. Uh, this member state has not only paid its dues in full, but it is the only place in the world where you will find the bee hummingbird. Totally tiny, light as a feather, this creature weighs only two grams. The male is stunning with iridescent red head and turquoise upper parts, while the female is mostly turquoise. The bee hummingbird boasts the smallest nest in the world, only one inch in diameter and depth, and their eggs are also the smallest bird eggs, measuring half the weight of a standard paper clip. What country is this? Um, be not too far, not too far. Cuba. So we say thank you to our friends in Havana, and we hope they will, we're happy they gave us the money, and we hope they keep that humming, that um, bee hummingbird safe. James then Edith. So the Secretary General um, in the last couple of hours has been meeting with the Prime Minister of Qatar. As you know, um, there have been talks going on between Qatar, Egypt, Israel and the US um, can, uh, with the aim to try and get another cessation. Um, what, can you tell us what they discussed and, and was the Secretary General brought up to date with the latest on those negotiations? Sure. I mean, this is part of the Secretary General's ongoing consultations with uh, the Qatari uh, leadership. The Prime Minister was here. They've, no surprise, discussed the efforts uh, underway to end uh, the fighting to secure the release of the hostages and to ensure support uh, for humanitarian operations. Was the Secretary General given any timeline for a potential start to a new cessation? He, he was briefed on, uh, on, on the latest. And I will not brief you on the latest. <laughs> uh, Edie, and then Margaret, then Michelle. Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. Gee, ahead, that Edie. was my question, and yeah. what? <laughs> what was the latest? Yeah. Um, on another subject then, um, Kim Jong-un in North Korea has called for his military to step up war preparations as the country carried out another one in a series of missile tests. Does the Secretary General have any reaction to this You quote? know, I think we're, we're very concerned, increasingly concerned by everything we've seen uh, in the last few, few weeks. Uh, the Secretary General, for his part, will continue to call for a de-escalation, a, a resumption of the diplomatic uh, dialogue, and also just for the creation of a, of a of an environment that's conducive uh, to such a diplomatic uh, dialogue because diplomatic engagement remains the only possible way forward. Margaret. Uh, just on the Qatari Prime Minister, did he offer any new funding for UNRWA while he spoke with the Secretary General? I think the, General? the issue of humanitarian funding was discussed uh, in a very uh, positive atmosphere, and I will leave it at that. Uh, Deji, then Silvian. Uh, First, two follow-ups. Uh, the first one, uh, on the founding of UNRWA, uh, do you have any update of those uh, donor countries which suspends the funding? Uh, no, any any I, of you, them you, changed uh, their uh, minds? You should be in touch with UNRWA. They can give you the latest, but it's about 16. Uh, okay. Um, the second, uh, I, believe, I believe you said the UN is trying to have a delegation to visit the northern Gaza. Uh, which hasn't been there yet. Uh, what's the latest update we on that? We sent a reconnaissance mission that went uh, yesterday uh, and the day before that was there. This is sort of the first, uh, first we want to send reconnaissance, but it's not the full assessment mission that we've been talking about. As soon as that happens, we will let you know. Uh, okay, so one last question. Several countries, including the United States, are considering putting sanctions on some violent settlers in West Bank. Uh, what's what's the position of the UN on this? Do you think this could help um, uh, to stabilize the situation uh, we, we in West Bank? No, uh, we have no comment on these bilateral uh, sanctions. 
On the issue of uh, settler violence, I think we've been very clear uh, on that. Sylvian. Uh, thank you, Stefan. On Lebanon, a British military delegation and another French visited Israel twice to discuss how to implement Resolution 1701 and avoid escalation. Uh, among the ideas put forward uh, is the British proposal proposed building surveillance towers along the border of the Lebanese side, similar to the surveillance towers built uh, by in 2014 along the Lebanese border between Syria and Lebanon. Is it, do you have any reaction I, on I that? I haven't seen those particular reports. What I do know is that there are a lot of people who have a responsibility in ensuring that Resolution 1701 is fully implemented. Uh, this has been our message uh, to a number of interlocutors. And of course, to see the full implementation of that resolution, I think, would help uh, stabilize the situation along the blue line. Another question, another proposal, it's to form an international commission uh, responsible for supervising the situation at the border, Lebanese border. I, 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 it's I, on the table. Yeah, Do you I have seen, any reaction I haven't on seen, that? Uh, I haven't seen detail of that, but I'm happy to look into it. And uh, yesterday, Dr. Uh, David Cameron was uh, in Lebanon to discuss the question of recognition of Palestinian state, including at the UN. Uh, how many countries till now have expressed their recognition of pal a Palestinian that's state, not please? A, that's not a, an accounting that we keep. Uh, obviously, I mean, to, for full, if you talk about full membership into the UN, there's a procedure outlined in the charter for that. But in terms of what countries have uh, publicly and talked about it, I, I, it's not a number that we keep. Thank you. Uh, Lenka. Thank you, Steph. Uh, please, I have a question. Thank you so much for the uh, statement you put out on the immigration over the U.S. border. But I was wondering, would there be any chance, please, to get some numbers, like how many debit cards were handed out and how uh, much cash? We, we will put you in touch directly with our colleagues at the International Organization for Migration who would have those, uh, who would have the, the, that detail. Thank you. I, I tried to contact them, you know, but they didn't reply. Well, we will, uh, <laughs> we will help you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Stefano, please go ahead. Thank you, Stefan. Um, two questions. One is um, about Lebanon. It's a kind of follow-up. But because the um, um, Defense Minister Galant said that basically uh, very soon there could be action, more action in the, in the um, north border, uh, do you have a what is the plan of the UN? I mean, if it really the the Israel end up to invade uh, Lebanon, what will happen to the over ten thousand uh, uh, blue helmets there? That there is a plan to move them. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I, I'm not going to uh, get into the business of of hypotheticals. Uh, what we do not want to see is uh, increased kinetic activity. Uh, across the blue line or full-out uh, war across uh, the blue line, which would have devastating impact for uh, civilians on both sides of that line, and not to mention the region. And uh, then I have another question is, um, uh, do you confirm that this morning in front of the um, residence of uh, Secretary General, there was uh, a protest uh, by a pro-Israeli, but I don't know more. I don't know much, so I would like to know from you, first of all, if you can confirm that. Sure, what I can tell you is that every, uh, and you, every Friday morning, uh, there is a presence in front of the Secretary General's residence of uh, relatives of hostages, of Israeli hostages, uh, who've been, who are held in Gaza. Uh, and I can tell you, every Friday morning, the secretary steps out of his uh, home and has a discussions and talks to them uh, and uh, engages with them uh, in his um, in, in his way, which you know is very on a very human uh, on a very human level. And it, it's every Friday morning. But since, can you be more precise? Since when? 
I, I'm, I mean, I, I'm not the one organizing the demonstration, uh, but it's been going on for quite, uh, uh, for quite some time now. You, please. Thank you, Steve. So I have just a quick follow-up question about uh, assessment mission on Northern Gaza. Mm -hmm. So do you, have, do you have a more detailed timeline, like uh, when will they start to full investigation? No, so the, the obviously getting into, for us to get into Northern Gaza is, is uh, challenging. Um, there are a lot of moving parts that have to be uh, aligned. Uh, the assessment, the um, reconnaissance mission went in, and as soon as the assessment mission can go in, uh, we will let you know. Edith. Uh, thank you, Steph. Um, the Israeli military has said they're finishing their operations in the Khan Yunus area and are moving, planning to move south to Rafa, where um, a very significant majority of Gaza's population was initially ordered to move. How concerned is the Secretary General about this planned new offensive in an area where there are so many civilians who Extremely. Fled. I mean, we've already seen the, the impact on civilians with the actions in Khan Yunus, not only the impact, and also the impact of, on our own facility when uh, our compound was, uh, was hit. Uh, obviously, since, since the beginning of the ground operations, there's been movement of people to the south. And so it's, it, the further south you get, the more densely populated it is, and people living in, in dire makeshift conditions out in the open and, or in very flimsy tents in cold and wet uh, weather. So it is very worrying indeed. Thank you all. Have a wonderful weekend. If we speak over the weekend, that will not be good news. So let's hope we speak on Monday. What? Are you anticipating No, I'm not. Just don't, don't call me. I'll call you, man. No, we don't have to stay here.